Hello, thank you. Uh, okay, good, the mic is working. Um, so it's the very last talk of the very last day, so I'm sure everybody is super duper excited and alert and ready to pay complete 100% attention. Uh, I'll try to make sure you do. Um, also, uh, I've only had three cups of coffee today instead of the normal four or five, so hopefully uh, that will help me speak slowly so that everybody can understand everything. So uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I work at Big Fish Games in Seattle, Washington, uh, which is a mobile game company. Um, some of the titles is uh, Gummy Drop and uh, Fairway Solitaire and Big Fish Casino and uh, a bunch of other mobile games. Uh, but I want to clarify that I am not a game tester. Um, <laughs> and thank God for that. Um, most of the time uh, at Big Fish, I've been testing the services and the APIs that are running behind the games. And uh, personally, I found that much more interesting than play testing. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So let's get this show on the road. And the button worked. Yay. All right. So once upon a time, there was a service. And it was a good service. It, uh, it's been in production since about 2014. So it's been chugging along for five years, supporting multiple games. Um, it does have a weird interface, unlike, as far as I can tell, any other service in the entire world. Uh, the developer who first developed the service, he left the company three years ago, and we're here holding the bag trying to keep this thing going. Um, it does support multiple games. It has a very rich set of APIs for games to use, and it's currently serving about 800,000 daily active users. So it's a service that gets a lot of use in production, uh, three to 4,000 uh, requests per second coming through this service. So it's very important, uh, game critical, millions of dollars, basically, or depending on this service functioning. But there was a problem. Um, while we had a decent amount of integration tests and we did a lot of unit testing, well, mostly I wrote acceptance tests. There wasn't a whole lot of unit testing. Um, but we still didn't really have any, any idea what this service was doing in the actual real world. Um, we didn't know, I mean, we had, this service probably has 20, 30 different APIs. We didn't know exactly how many times each one was really being used by the games we were supporting. We didn't know how often they were failing. We didn't know how long the responses were taking most of the time. And sometimes the service would fail um, or it would get backed up one time, of course, 3 p.m. before a holiday. All of a sudden the service isn't working. We're just about ready to leave, but no. We all have to run back to our desks and spend hours figuring out why the service isn't working. And eventually after we rebooted it a bunch of time, it started working again, right? <laughs> So obviously it wasn't ideal um, that uh, we didn't know everything that was going on. So what was the missing piece? So we had a decent amount of tests. Uh, we have a continuous build and deployment system. We have multiple test environments um, where not only are we testing it uh, with test automation, but also the, game t the play testers are using it to play test the games in their test environment. So it was getting a lot of testing on this service, um, but that's not, that's just sort of making sure the basics are working. It's not telling us what is really going on in production. That was the part that we didn't know. That was the piece that we really needed. So, a little word, of course, you have to have this meme whenever you test in production, right? Uh, so traditionally, when I started, I started testing about 20 years ago, and testing in production when I started was a bad thing. If you test in production, it means you weren't testing it before. Um, so for example, you have a deployment, and then it turns out the deployment goes badly. It's like, oh, well, now we're testing in production. Ha, 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 and then you roll it back. So, <laughs> um, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about junking all the rest of your tests and only testing in production. This is talking about how um, you can use the production environment to test even more efficiently than you're doing now. And let's talk about the facts. The fact is you're already testing your services in production. Every time somebody uses your service out in the real world, they're testing its functionality. Um, so whether you like it or not, uh, the testing is already happening. The data is already out there. So we might as well gather it all up and try to make the best use of it that we can. 
Okay. So, the other thing. If you're saying, well, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to test in production. I'm going to do all the testing before it goes to production. I'm going to test it all. Bug free, bug zero, that's what we're doing, right? Um, but let's get real. I mean, we had the, the talk this morning about exploratory testing and how uh, you can test and test, but there's always going to be some known unknown. Something that you don't know about is already out there. Um, there's always going to be something, something that's going to get away from you. Um, maybe you have a query that every week it's getting 20 milliseconds slower. Maybe you have some subtle little difference in your UI or in the way that your APIs are working that's causing 1% of your customer base to stop playing. There's always going to be something out there that you're not going to be able to catch uh, just by testing in the test environments. So, what about the sandbox? Um, we talk a lot about sandbox environments. Uh, we try to set them up so that we can uh, play really nicely with our trucks and our little diggers in the sandbox, and it's fun, but what's the problems with that? Um, the first of all, the variety of client combinations, especially with mobile applications, you have uh, three, well, now that Edge is going to be Chrome, maybe it's only two, I don't know. Lots of different browsers. Um, the devices, there's like, last time I checked our device profile, we had 30 different combinations of Android OSs and 30 different combinations of iOS devices all hitting at the same time. Um, and then, of course, they're going to have different versions of your application running on them and different combinations of other things that are going on. There's all the network things. Is somebody on a, a Wi-Fi network? Are they 3G, 4G? Uh, are they going through a tunnel while they're playing your game? I mean, there's all sorts of things that are going on that you can't necessarily cover with the sandbox. You can try. Uh, you can get the most common ones, but you're not going to get all the things that are happening in the real world. And uh, then there's test environments. So we have test, and we have, Q we have like two or three different QA environments, and then there's stage and stage three or whatever. <laughs> I mean, we seem to be able to build environments. Uh, whoops. There we go. And, um, but do they really match what the production environment is? Uh, I have to admit that at our company, they don't always match. Um, so for example, the production environment might have 16 hosts running, but QA only has two. The QA database is hosting all the other QA databases, uh, unlike production, which is just on its own. So there's a, there's a lot of ways that the environment you're testing on is not, test, is not reflecting what's happening in, really in production. So then you can say, well, I mean, we're in the cloud. We can roll out our Docker, Kubernetes, whatever, and we can have an exact match of what's going on in production. No problem. But what about your user base? Can you replicate the actual activity that's going on in production, even with an exact match of your environment? No. No. I'm just going to tell you no. You're not going to be able to do it. Um, so, and here's why. So let's. Uh, Pretend that when you're testing your application, you're sort of teaching it how to dance. You're going to go out to the club. You don't want your application to make a fool of itself. So you, know, you get the basics going at least. You got the happy paths. You got regression, boundary cases. It's, everything is basically working. And so then, you know, if you want the really thorough test coverage, you have your fuel unit tests, continuous build, performance, load testing, maybe even a security test pass if you're really advanced. Um, exploratory sessions, so then your application is moonwalking all over your test environment. It's looking super amazingly good. Everything's going to be fine. We're going to do this release, it's all going to be fine. Except this is what you're releasing it to, right? <laughs> so it doesn't matter how well your application can moonwalk in the climate-controlled club when you're throwing it into the mosh pit of the real world. So, so what are we going to do? What we need to do is we need to actually accept the mosh pit environment, accept what's going on, and try to understand as much as possible about what's happening to our application. So it's sort of uh, to kind of go over so you're primed what we're going to be talking about. Um, so we start, does this have a pointer? No, that's fine. <laughs> um, so you start out with, uh, you think about, well, the things I want to look at, like the APIs that we're using and how fast they're going. And once you have the monitor set up, you can start sort of observing patterns. 
So you have the monitoring and then you observe. And sort of like you just sort of sit back and watch. This is the exploratory part. This is the fun part of testing and production. And then when you observe something interesting, maybe it's a pattern, maybe it's an anti-pattern that looks weird, you can test around those observations and see what they're doing. You increase your knowledge of the software and then you add more monitoring. So it's a and then you observe more, and it's a, a beautiful, happy cycle of observing and testing and improving our software. So, all right, so, yay, we're all going to monitor, we're all going to get everything going on. So what are some common tools? They basically break down into things that analyze your logs and things that analyze a stream of data directly from your application. So, uh, and I'll have some references at the end. Um, the really common log-based ones, you have the ELK stack, and uh, if you've ever wondered what ELK stack stands for, it stands for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Elasticsearch is a, it searches the data, and Logstash is what's consuming the logs, putting it in, and then Kibana is displaying it. Um, so that's a, an open source solution for log-based testing. Splunk is another one uh, that's very commonly used. That's a uh, closed source, um, uh, but it's pretty common. Uh, pretty, and maybe your organization's already using it, I don't know. So then there's various time DB based solutions as well where you don't have to be consuming the logs, the data is being streamed directly into the service. So Graphite, StatsD, InfluxDB, uh, Kafka, these are some other ones um, that are out there. So there's, and then the data's no good if you can't look at it. So yeah, you have Grafana, you have Kibana. So these are some of the tools that are available. There's lots of others available. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is what we decided to use, which was a combination of Graphite and Grafana. And this is what it looks like. Uh, I did not go by legal with this uh, presentation, so I have to white out everything about our actual application. Um, but this is, this is the sort of thing. It looks very pretty when you're sitting at your desk. It's a nice sense of uh, accomplishment when you get a graph that's pretty. So uh, let's, uh, why did this work for us? Why, because first of all, um, our ops group already had Graphite working. This is like 90% of choosing an open source tool is choosing one that your ops department already knows about. So um, our ops department uh, was already using Graphite for their own monitoring. So we're like, okay, we're gonna just go in on that. Um, and even if you don't, uh, even if ops doesn't have Graphite, it's actually quite easy to get it going on your own. I have it running right now on my laptop. Uh, from a Docker image. So um, even if uh, that's one of the reasons, other reasons we chose Graphite because it's a very low uh, threshold for getting started. Uh, the other thing is because of the nature of our service being so weird and uh, not having a really great interface is that it was easier to just instrument the code than it was to fix the logs. Uh, we tried various ways of making the logs more readable and it just, it just, <laughs> um, I could go on and on about how goofy this service is, but just trust me when I say it was easier to instrument the code. Um, the Graphite query language is very flexible, uh, and I find it a lot easier to use, and I'll show you an example of how we're using it. Uh, there's templating, so you can, have, uh, you can have a lot of flexibility in the graphs, and of course it's nice to look at. So, um, some ways when I talk about instrumenting the code, this is an example. Um, so if you have this as a service that's based on Jetty, Netty, Netty, <laughs> okay. Um, so all this stuff is coming into a channel read and then this response is handled and then you can sort of have one thing at the end when it's ready to respond where you say, oh, by the way, send some graph, send some metrics. And you'll have something like this. Uh, Graphite has a lot of um, different clients. You can use it with Java, JavaScript, Python, pretty much any language is gonna have some sort of uh, Graphite client available. And uh, so you just have a centralized area where it's putting in all the stuff. And you can see that it's this uh, services dot blah, blah, blah. This is how you're organizing it. Um, if you happen to use something like Drop Wizard or with annotations, it's even easier. Um, you can just annotate your uh, code here where you have all the different, I wish I had a pointer. You're just gonna have to <laughs> figure it out from here. Um, so just with annotations, you can get the instrumenting going on the way you do it. So, and then you get it into Graphite. All these dots turn into folders. The stuff is there, and then you get it pretty. Okay, so let's take a look at, now we're gonna get really crazy here and do some live coding. 
Okay, so, hello, where's my mouse? Ah. ah, okay, this is always the fun part, right? So, let's take a look at the code first. Um, Uh-oh, <laughs> I think I lost the um, feed here. Hello? <laughs> I can turn my laptop around, but I don't think that'll be very visible. <laughs> yeah, is it uh, F5? Ah. <laughs> uh. Maybe it's this uh, desktop one, too. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> it's okay. If it's not going to work, it won't work. As long as we can get the uh, PowerPoint going back on. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. I've I've done this before and it just uh it did the thing but okay. Oh, we're we're in. We're in. Okay. Thank you very much. Yay. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Ah, okay. I see. Okay. Now everything is working perfectly. From here on out, it's going to be great. Okay. So, where were we? Oh, yes. The, uh, the code. Um, so, this is uh, the service that was running. Uh, you can see that uh, I have it all here. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Drop Wizard, but it's, if you run Java services, you're probably familiar with it. Um, so, this is the configuration. All I have to do is add uh, these loggers and the graphite, and it's, uh, it's all working. So, um, or here, right? Metrics. So, that's the code. And then we, I uh, ran some stuff earlier. I would run it here, but it would be even more of a distraction, and the whining would drive everybody out of the room, my poor old laptop running it. So we're just going to do some stuff I did before. Uh, so big in that. All right, so we have, uh, this is what graphite looks like. It's a little hard to read, um, but we have our errors, we have a meter, we have a timer, and it shows Various, we have M15, M1, M5. So this all comes for free uh, with the Graphite client. It does all the aggregation behind the scenes so that it already tells you uh, the M1 rate, that's how many times within one minute. Uh, the M5 is how many times this happened within five. M15, how many within 15. Um, and then just in the timer, we also get a bunch of interesting statistics with the P50. So half of the requests were at or above this level. You can get, when people talk about like the, the 99, then the five nines, whatever, uh, this is the kind of thing they're talking about. So this goes up to three nines, so you can see what the very worst 0.1% of your customer base is experiencing. So 0.1% of your customer base, you think, well, but if you have uh, 800,000 people a day, that's 800 people that are having this problem. And maybe those are the people that are actually buying stuff from your application, so you don't want to make them mad. Um, so these are the sort of statistics that you get uh, with Graphite for free, StatsD, and um, I mean, there's a lot of aggregation that happens with the other ones as well, uh, P95. So this is all, whenever you see this P, this is uh, uh, the 95th percentile. So 95 were at or below this level, and 5% were above. So that's what that's about. So this is what it looks like in Graphite. And I can get here, and ooh. So it's not a very pretty graph. I mean, I can... 
change the time to be, this is 24 hours by default, and I can change it to two, um, or maybe three. <laughs> um, the point is, is that, you know, Graphite has this capability of showing you stuff, but there we go. Um, but, meh, it's, it's sort of rudimentary. It's just sort of make sure that it's there. Where things really get fun is with Grafana. So let's look at Grafana here. Uh, so this is a dashboard I made. And uh, this, again, on a Mac, you can install it with brew install. It's very simple. Uh, so I have a Docker image, I have Grafana with brew install, and I have all this going on. So I can sort of zoom in on our section here, and uh, we can see all the player requests. It's broken down by the API. Um, so each one you can see, if it wasn't so blurry, but you get the idea. Um, you know, I got thread counts, memory usage, all of my APIs, the response time, and uh, I'm just going to show you an example of how you can create a new one. So when I was talking about the templating, we um, are going here to the settings. So the variables. I have a variable here, um, which is based, again, on my dot, 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 on my directory structure, and this is the API name. Simple example, player, star. So these are all the possible API names, or I can have all. Uh, I have it hidden now, but let's expose it just for fun. OK. So now I can go back to my thing, and now I have this drop down, right? So we can pick one. And now you can see that I've sort of zoomed in on the get player. So this is what get player was doing. This is, so you can say uh, the P50 was sort of like, you know, that's not so bad. 1.25 milliseconds, this is all running on my local machine. So 1.25 milliseconds is about what I would expect for a get. Um, but then if you're looking at uh, the P, whoops, P95 or P99, it was peaking up to here, 62 milliseconds to run something on my local machine. And then the P99 level is getting 400 milliseconds. So it was, my machine was working very hard and things were getting backed up. Um, and if you're looking at a real, I mean, I've done all this talk about how the sandbox isn't real, and now I'm showing an example of something I ran on my laptop. But it's just to to sort of give you an idea of the kinds of things you can graph. Um, so let's create a new graph. So I come up here, and I add a panel and a graph. And we can edit this. And you have a really good, I have this local graphite data source, which is what I showed you before. And then I can select its sample. I don't have glasses on, but I'm sure it'll be fine, just like everything else. Fine. OK. <laughs> All right. Um, so here, uh, we're doing it by that API uh, variable that we created. This is going to be sort of our wild card in here. And let's look at errors. I'm interested to see uh, what kind of errors we're getting. We'll just do a count of exceptions. So this is a count. Uh, let's do one that actually had some errors. There we go. All right. Um, so. And then I can duplicate this, duplicate. Um, so then what I want to do is, uh, what I want to find out is the percentage of errors. How often is a particular API actually failing uh, when it's called? So I get the, uh, our meter, and then this is going to be a count here. OK, well, this is not helping me much. Obviously, it's being requested a lot more than it's entering out. But graphite to the rescue here. Uh, as percent. So I can take one series and divide it by another very easily. So I'm taking this A series, which is the exceptions, and I'm going to divide it by the B series. And then I can hide this one. All right. So now, um, so now we're getting something kind of interesting. It's still a low percentage, maybe up to 1% error rate, um, but we can actually see something that's going on here. So let's go back to our dashboard. But then this is where things get really cool. But now let's see. Oops, I forgot to do one thing. All right. So then I go to general here, and I panel title's not very good. So let's say, uh, and here we're going to repeat it for each value of API. There we go. Now, 
board. And go to all, ta-da, ta-da. All right, yes, so now I, ha I have this value for each of my APIs. Um, and now you can see here, for some reason, this one is going up to 20%. I was getting a 20% error rate on this particular end level. Um, so this is the sort of thing where it seemed like when I was looking at the overall graphs that everything was fine, but when I'm zooming in on a particular API, a particular sort of metric that I'm looking at, now all of a sudden it's clear. Something is wrong with the end level. Um, and it turns out that there was a flaw in my JMeter script, uh, as otherwise known as the client application, which was in this case JMeter. But um, just this, this, is, this is how you can use a tool like Graphite or Grafana. You can sort of zoom in on a certain area, and when you start observing things, things will pop out. Uh, so yeah, so that is that demonstration. So now let's save that. And now I'm going to tempt fate again by trying to switch back to PowerPoint. All right, I'm sure it's going to work fine. Ta-da! All right, and presenter view. Yay, all right. <laughs> okay, so that's sort of an idea of what you can do. So what do, that's uh, what we set up for our service, and then what do we track? Um, we, uh, for the specific APIs, we track the request count, failures. Uh, we actually track it for specific exceptions. So how many times specific exceptions are coming in? And of course, the response time. Uh, memcache usage, so every time we would put something in memcache, every time there was a, we would get or hit or miss, uh, we recorded that in Graphite. Uh, thread counts, so uh, since it's a Netty-based service, the threading within the worker threads uh, management is very important. Uh, so we wanted to find out, well, how many worker threads are we creating and uh, how are they being used um, because we wanted to see if we were sort of backing things up. Um, yeah, the exceptions, like I said, how many exceptions were thrown for specific uh, problems. Uh, this one is a really important one. If you have an event, if you have a service that's calling another service, uh, it's really nice to know if that other service is behaving correctly. So you can throw in some sort of measurement, just the response time for this service that you're calling, and put that into Graphite as well, or uh, whatever. So you can see within your own dashboard what's happening. Uh, and of course, system stats, uh, CPU, memory, ports, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, database. So the system in the database, our ops w actually already had some of this stuff. And the other thing I, I didn't show is that with Grafana, it's all JSON based. So you can get a JSON download of your dashboard and you can cut and paste things from one dashboard into another via JSON. So if, you, uh, if your ops team already has a dashboard that's doing the system ops, you can just grab that little chunk for your server and stick it into your own dashboard. All right, so what did we find? That's the whole point, right, is to catch bugs. So let's see what we found. Um, we found that certain API, call, API calls were failing every time they were being called. And uh, we didn't know that it was going on because what was happening is that there was some old leftover code in the client uh, that was calling the wrong parameters. Uh, the client didn't care that it failed, um, but it was generating a lot of traffic extra traffic on our service that we didn't need, so we uh, found that. Uh, we found a case where a game, it turned out that 90% of the calls they made were saved data. 90% of all the calls this game was making was saved data. And once again, the game seemed to be working all right. This was the sort of thing when you're play testing, it's like, well, hey, my data is always like, up to date. It turns out because every time you flipped a card, it was saving data. Every time you've turned a tile in this Mahjong game, it would save, so if you turn 20 tiles in your level, then it's saving 20 times in a level instead of one. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that can cause a lot of extra problems uh, in your database, uh, especially if your game all of a sudden gets popular and it turns out that you're doing 20 saves when you should do one, that could cause a big problem. So uh, found that sort of thing. Memcache issues, uh, we found out that APIs were attempting to save null values and it was causing a memcache failure. Uh, once again, not something that was immediately available, not, it's the sort of thing like it, it's not broken, everything was still working, but this is over time causing a lot of extra network traffic that we didn't need to uh, have. So we fixed that. Um, database overuse, I kind of talked about the 90% uh, of calls to save data. Um, there was another case, this was sort of a situation where it was uh, sort of getting an overall look at this one API, very popular, load items. Load items. And then I sort of started wondering, well, what items are being loaded? I didn't know this game had any items. 
and yet it's calling load items all the time. So then, um, because I had sort of been inspired by what I was seeing in production, I dug a little more into load items, and it turned out what was happening is that the only time a customer would have an item is if it was given to them by customer service. So somebody would call and complain, or they'd send email and complain, and we'd give them something for free. So every 30 seconds, the game is saying, hey, do I have any items? Do I have any items? 99% of the times, the answer was no. No, you don't have any items. Um, but we were still calling the database every time. So when we were able to sort of look into this and have a better understanding of what was going on, uh, well, it would be nice if the game didn't do that, but it's a lot easier to update the service than it is to update the client. So we were able to sort of work around it um, and make it so that we cached the value of whether they called customer service or not, and if they had never talked to customer service, we just said, no, you don't have any items. Uh, and that saved about 10% of the overall traffic on our database. We were able to save 10% um, by cutting back on that call. So, anyway, slow requests. I talked about this before. Um, if you have a, we have a third-party dependency, and we put in a graph. What is this third party actually doing? It turns out that they were not quite as available as we thought they were. Sometimes it would be okay, but then every now and then, they would decide, yeah, we don't want to get back to you for like five seconds, six seconds, or something like that. Just sort of a spike would happen. And that would cause a cascading effect where everything else would slow down because we weren't able to log in for five seconds or 10 seconds. Um, so all these issues that we'd had where the service was getting backed up, it turned out it was because our third party service was not behaving properly. And so with the monitoring, we were able to see the third party service along with our own response times and go, yeah, that's it. It's their fault, not our fault. No. <laughs> no. But, and once again, because with that knowledge, it's not that we can fix this third-party service, but we were able to redesign uh, our APIs in a way where we could make it, when this was failing, it didn't cause a cascading failure throughout everything else. So even if we can't fix the root cause, we can still work with what's going on better. And uh, thread config issues, um, by, I talked about how we were talking to thread pools. It turned out that we were make, making our pools too small. Uh, that we uh, were limiting to 16 threads when we could have up to 50 threads or something like that. So once we were able to get more usage out of each of our boxes by uh, fixing the thread pools. So that's the sort of thing that we were able to do with our dashboards. It was really cool. But once you have a dashboard, you've got to make sure it's maintained. Um, only have the things you care about on it. Like, for example, you can have a lot of stuff. You know, we had all the memcache stuff, and we had like a bazillion little tiny graphs. And then it's like, well, OK, we didn't find anything else with memcache. So maybe we can get rid of those bazillion tiny little graphs. Or you can have it, uh, you can drop it down so you're only looking at the game you care about and not the other stuff. So being able to sort of, oops, um, do you, to, to consolidate as much as possible so you have the things you care about, like you have this and then you have your system dashboard in one place. So you don't have to be flipping between your dashboards. Uh, this is why I talk about where you take the JSON blob, you cut it into another or whatever so you can see everything together. Um, and then the other thing is to check that your monitoring solution is not adding extra overhead. Um, graphite by, for, for example, Graphite by default goes over a TCP connection. So it's opening up a TCP connection and this is extra network traffic that maybe you don't want to have that. You could actually have it be UDP instead. Um, so that sort of thing, if you have an understanding, it's like, well, we can, so because UDP is sort of, it's a set it and forget it. So instead of taking up TCP network ports, you can do the UDP, and then that's, that's lower overhead on your service. And then um, dashboard maintenance, uh, reevaluating your metrics. You have to make sure you're understanding what you're collecting and that you're doing the right thing. Um, that when you're looking at this, uh, do you do stats, do you have like upper 90 and mean 90? What does that mean? Well, it turns out the mean 90 is the 90% and the upper 90 is like the top 10%. Anyway, each, each tool has sort of its own little aggregating meanings and knowing what you're looking at is super important. So let's talk about observability. Um, if you are active on Twitter lately or something like that, there's sort of a new buzzword that's going around the monitoring, which is observability. Ooh, we're, we're not just monitoring, we're observing. It's very special, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, it is actually pretty special because what um, the observability is about is instead of everything I've shown you up till now, it's an aggregate. Um, 
So when I'm showing you like the M1, the uh, request per minute, it's just that number of requests. You don't actually have the actual request per minute information. But what if you could have that, right? So the idea with the observability is that you can actually have an overall look and then drill down into a specific request. Um, and then uh, you can also sort of tie in the database stuff together and all that. Anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about this because I think it's a really exciting development. Um, and uh, I definitely would recommend Charity Majors as a follow if you're interested in this. Um, but this is uh, something that's up and coming. And uh, let's take a look. OK, here we go. Oh, not yet. All right. So, so this is a typical metrics dashboard. This happens to be one from Stackdriver. Um, if you use uh, Amazon Cloud, the Cloud Watch is a similar sort of look. So it's like, ooh, I'm out in the cloud, and I have a service, and I'm getting all this monitoring for free. It's so great, sort of. <laughs> I mean, it is for free, but I'm going to try this here. Ah. Like here? I mean, yes, something happened. Ooh, something happened here. I don't know what happened, but it's something. So, right? so, so a lot of times with these like Stackdriver and CloudWatch, you have these things that happen, but it's not really clear what's going on. Um, but if you have all of the data, so for example, what I just showed you before was from a Firebase, uh, a Firebase solution. In Firebase, you can sort of get the actual log of, for the last five minutes, what was actually happening. So I can take that last five minutes of log, I can throw it up into Honeycomb, as an example, and uh, so then I have this aggregate view here, and then... I can zoom in and actually look at all the different requests. And I can even go to a specific user here and see what happened. Right? So let's uh, take a look at that. Cross our fingers. Right? Ah, yay. It's all working now. So, yeah. um, so. Hello. There we go. Uh, so this is, this is the dashboard I was talking about, which is pretty to look at, but it's like, I don't know. I'm not real jazzed on this. It's not very clear what's going on. But we can take into Honeycomb, and this is, um, we can look at this, and then we look at the raw data here. There we go. And uh, it shows every single request that is part of that here. And I can even go here, and I'm like, well, I want to look at this particular API or this particular, and I can filter here just on this one IP address. Or can I? I might, maybe I haven't been paying my bills and it won't let me. Uh, <laughs> um, I, am actually, uh, I am actually trying to pitch this to my management to actually get a paid account. Um, but the point is, is if I was able to do that uh, actual query, then I could get in and I could see, well, this particular user, what happened? Oh, it turns out that I thought a simple chat thing was just sort of 20 things. This user, within five minutes, they did 600, 600 hits on our database. I mean, what was going on with that? Are they, are they some kind of nefarious person? Is there a client issue? Is, are we not understanding our chat solution the way we thought it was? So that's when you have the observability, you can really dig in and get a lot of extra information which is really cool. So that is Honeycomb. And uh, uh, Honeycomb is sort of a pioneer in this space, but I really think there's going to be uh, more in the future because it's super duper useful. Uh, so back to presenter view. All right, everything. So this is a talk I went to by Charity Majors, so a slide of a slide of a slide going on here, where she had this slide saying monitoring is dead. If you follow Charity, she's, she's going to say all sorts of stuff like monitoring is dead and you don't want to do anything. And monitoring's not dead, not in my opinion. It's dead like testing is dead, right? Um, so why are we going to still bother with the traditional aggregate monitoring? Well, the tools are already there, right? Um, they're open source. Uh, I don't have to depend on my management paying the bill every month necessarily for it to work. Um, you still can get a high-level view of what's going on. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's still... It can inform your other testing, and it's, I mean, if you're like, well, I can't have perfect observability, so what is even the point? No. If you're monitoring anything, that's an improvement over monitoring nothing. So, it's like, okay, that's great, whatever, you're finding problems, that's all debugging. Ah, we're testing here, we're not debugging, what is going on, right? So, 
But the performance environment, the monitoring setup is really great for actual testing, not just debugging. So one of my favorite uses is for performance testing. Um, so before uh, we had all this uh, monitoring solution set up, I would try to test in a stage environment, and I'd be like, OK, so this is two boxes. And so if I get 25% of our expected hit rate in production on our 25% thing, then uh, I guess it's fine. Sure, release. I guess it's all right. So, um, but you don't have to do that with, uh, if you're able to do it in production. So first of all, your new APIs can be on production on the production servers before your clients are updated. So you can have your server update. You have the stuff out there. You don't have to worry about the clients hitting it. You can do a pure test on your new API. And you don't have to translate that this performance on these uh, crappy boxes over here is sort of equivalent to a third of production, and so it's fine. You don't have to do that. You can actually run your test in production and say this is how it's going to work in production. And this is really the most important thing. When you're testing in production, you're testing in the real environment. All the stuff that's going to be happening in production is there. All of the background noise, all of the background load, it's happening right there. So, <coughs> excuse me. So when you run your test, you're, you're going to have real confidence in your results. So for example, one time uh, we were doing a new API. They were going to do a new feature, which had a bunch of new, new stuff going on. So we wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to break everything. So we put the new APIs out there. I did a small test, just load testing the single API. All right while all the production stuff was going on. So the good thing about doing this is that I can turn it off right away. Um, if things are going bad, nothing went bad, but the CPU usage went up to 30%. It went up 30% just from this one API. And I was able to say, look, you guys got a problem. You got to fix this before we release the feature. And uh, there was like no argument about it. There was no wondering, well, is it because the box is bad? No, this is what's really going to happen in production if you don't fix it. And they fixed it. So. That uh, per performance testing is really great in production. <laughs> Sometimes people get a little nervous. You're like, oh, I want to load test this in production. What? What? You're going to do a load test in production? No. But then once you give them a result like that, they'll be OK with it, as long as you don't break everything. Right? <laughs> be sure you have your finger on the button to turn it off. Um, feature testing. So. Uh, if you do feature flagging, if you don't do feature flagging, you should definitely be doing feature flagging, where you can turn on and off features uh, at the configuration level. Um, so yeah. So you flag a feature, you turn it on, you set up the config to a certain box, and you can observe that one box. What's happening now on that box, now that this feature is active with all the services that are hitting there? Um, so. Go to zoom in, watch what happens, and then you can start getting a really good idea. Once again, not sort of guessing what the players are going to do, but actually seeing what happens with the actual players that are doing what they're doing. Right? Chaos testing is another one. Um, so Netflix is sort of like, I mean, chaos testing, we're like, well, we're just going to uh, knock everything over and see what happens. I mean, there is sort of that, but once again, you can do it very targeted. So you can say, OK, now that I'm Looking at production, now I'm going to take out this box and see what happens. Now I'm going to take down this one database and see what ha this one database host and see what happens. So you can you don't have to be chaotic about your chaos testing, but uh, you can still uh, see how that's going to go on. So sort of coming back to what we were doing before. Um, so the monitoring, the observing, the testing, it all sorts of goes together. I mean, you can say, oh, well, you're just debugging. But in the process of debugging, you're observing, you're learning more, you're expanding the amount of known unknowns. You can say, well, this thing is happening, and I don't know about it. Um, but I didn't know it was happening before, so that's an improvement. OK. <laughs> um, and so then you know, the exploring is part of testing. So the more that we can sort of see, kind of push the boundaries of what we know about our software, the better it is. Uh, because the software, we're not breaking it. It's already broken, right? We're just sort of exposing the breaks to the world. Whoops. So explore without fear with your new monitoring. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is some more information. Uh, the Elk stack, graphite, all that sort of stuff. 
you can contact me. Twitter is the best, is where I'm most active. Uh, LinkedIn, GitHub, all that sort of good stuff. And uh, yeah, and I'll be over in the discussion area if you uh, want to ask me some more. We can do questions. We have time for questions now as well, I think. OK? So thank you very much. And <laughs> Thanks, Amber, for your lecture. Uh -huh. I have a question about the graphite and metrics. Like, how do you do the analysis of what metrics you should collect for your project? Not saying about the API, but like, let's say like, the, I don't know, any new project. Because how would we do it like in our company? We just sit together and say, let's like collect this metric. OK, yeah, let's, let's collect this. Or let's collect this. And like, there is no real analysis. How like, maybe how do you do like any given advice? Um, well, I think uh, because dealing with sort of a standard service, it's, it's pretty, the initial stuff to collect at least is pretty obvious. It's like you have APIs, so let's see what's happening with each API. Um, and I think uh, what happens is that, so is that you think of something, well, I want to know how long this particular action takes. So maybe there's one thing in your application that you care about to begin with. So you can set up just a timer on like one certain method and then you can have that going. Uh, and I, what happens is that once you start monitoring one thing, once you start observing the process of what's going on with one thing, then more things will suggest themselves. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Everything is perfectly 100% clear and understandable. Yes? Oh, here's one over here. No, 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 he was just saying everything was great. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Yes, hi. <laughs> so thank you for your presentation. So I have uh, one conceptual question. So it's about uh, most of your approaches. So probably you know that uh, often we have some contracts with clients that uh, does not allow to use any production data for testing and mm -hmm. so on and so on. So how you deal with such situations and you know how probably you can advise how to sell your idea <laughs> to products so that uh, they can buy it and you can do something. Because, you know, I'm testing uh, database migration and for me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I had a uh, production database, I <laughs> would, you know, <laughs> be the luckiest guy in the world. But I think... But I don't. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, it might be a hard sell at first is like, well, let me just go into your code base and change everything and uh, pull out all your data. I, I, that, especially if you're a contract worker, that could definitely be a hard sell at first. I think the place to get started is actually with the, with the ops team or with DevOps. Chances are they're already doing some sort of something. They're already monitoring at least the system stats, CPU, that sort of thing. Uh, for database, um, even, even you know, the amount of traffic, that sort of, if you can sort of start getting in there with anything that's existing, and sort of looking at it, asking questions, and if you can start to pull out, you know, where there might be an anomaly. And that's actually also, instead of doing the code, that's where a log-based solution is probably an easier sell. Because then you can say, well, you have your logs, and we're just going to sort of pull all this, you know, not the confidential stuff. We're totally just going to pull all this other non-confidential and look at it. Um, so I think... Once again, you know, finding sort of an opening either with the DevOps team or through looking at the logs uh, is a way to get started with that without jumping into fixing all the code. 